Okay, well, not everybody left to Los Angeles. That's good to see. Some of us stayed around. So I was reading something on somebody's blog about how he found his kind of Buddhism. And it reminded me how I found my kind of Buddhism. And so let me share that with you today. When I came to Buddhism, there was just Buddhism. And it was pretty simple. There was a guy named Siddhartha who achieved his full perfection as a human, and we call that nirvana. And he never had to be reborn again. He went to nirvana forever and ever, which is unborn and undying. And when I came to Buddhism, it was like, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do what the Buddha did and achieve my release from suffering and be happy ever after. But then I kept reading more and more stuff about Buddhism and I realized there may be more than one kind of Buddhism. And maybe if I wanted to reach the goal that I had for myself, I should be more, I should be careful in how I practice and how I understood Buddhism. So I'm reading and reading, and then I came to this conclusion that there are two kinds of Buddhism, still oversimplified, but two main kinds of Buddhism. So we have Theravada Buddhism, Doctrine of the Elders, and we have Mahayana Buddhism, the big vehicle. I'm going to stop calling it the great vehicle, but it's the big vehicle. And within the big vehicle, we also have Vajrayana, Tibetan Buddhism, which is the diamond vehicle. And, but it's included in Mahayana. It's included in the, in, the, in the big vehicle. So I continued to read, and then I sort of came to this understanding that in Theravada Buddhism, they do what the Buddha said. In Mahayana Buddhism, they do what the Buddha did. Now, it might sound like a small distinction when you first hear it, But it is huge in the way you practice and understand Buddhism. So what makes a Buddha a Buddha? He has to come to a world where there is no Buddhism and there is no Buddhas. You can only have one Buddha at a time. So when Siddhartha was born 2,600 years ago, Buddhism had been lost to the world. It is said there were 27 Buddhas before Siddhartha. So he's the 28th Buddha. And because it had been lost to the world, he had no teacher. So he, through his own wisdom and determination and compassion, found the answer to suffering, nirvana. And we call him the Buddha, one who is awake. He awake through his own, he awoke through his own efforts. But now there were people who wanted to be like him, but there was a Buddha, and the Buddha was teaching, so they listened to the teachings of the Buddha, and they tried to do what the Buddha said to do, and a lot of them did, and a lot of them achieved nirvana. But they weren't Buddhas. They were arahants. Now, the difference between a Buddha and an arahant is an arahant is someone who has heard teachings from somebody and put them into practice and achieve the goal. But there was also an arhant called the silent Buddha, or Pacheka Buddha, which is someone who didn't hear the teachings, doesn't know what Buddhism is, and yet still achieves nirvana. So that's what the Christians will do. But us, we have the teaching, and all we need to do is follow that for a few hundred lifetimes, and we'll achieve our nirvana. So that went really well for a long time. And everybody was really happy, and everybody was working hard, and there were a bunch of ascetics, and they were living under trees and in caves, and and the population took a little dip then because of all these ascetics who were celibate. But in later generations, they made up for that. (laughs) And, And so we have this thing now, doing what the Buddha said, and everybody is real happy, and there's monks everywhere. And then nuns showed up. And the first nun was the the Buddha's stepmother. 
And she had lost her husband, the king. And so a woman with no man in her life back then was in dire straits. And she went to the Buddha, can you be a nun? I want to be a nun. I want to achieve nirvana. I want to be part of the, the sangha. And, and he said, no, 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 you can't do it because there's no woman who has that authority right now in India. And it, it, it might deflate my teachings and people wouldn't take it quite as seriously if there was a woman who was practicing and I just can't do it and blah, blah, blah. And then Ananda, his right-hand monk, his cousin, came up to the Buddha and said, you know, she raised you and she, you know made you well when you were sick and she fed you when you were hungry and she clothed you when you were naked and and she's a very special woman and why can't you ordain her? And he said the same thing that I had just said and then Ananda, clever as he was, said, but can a woman achieve nirvana? And the Buddha said, well, of course. So then he was stuck. And she became the first nun. And there's a wonderful series of poems by the original nuns called the Terigata, which you can buy in a small book or as part of the canonical texts of Buddhism. And, and it's wonderful to read what the, what the early nuns had to say about their practice and the environment they were practicing in. And, and uh, some of them went through some pretty hard times to get to that nirvana, but these are all nuns who achieve nirvana, who are sharing with you through prose their experiences. Okay, so now there was this guy, and, and his, name, his name was uh, uh, Bodhidharma. And he was like an Indian monk, and he decided to go up to China and bring the teachings to China. Okay, now that's how the story goes. I would think there's probably more people that brought the teachings, but, but he seems to be the guy, and he's got a really great story. And, and so he went up to China, and, and he realized they weren't ready to hear these teachings yet. So he decided to meditate, which, of course, is what we would do if we went to China. And he found a nice cave, and he was looking at the cave wall for seven years or 12 years and, until people were ready to hear him speak. Now, during that time, he was getting really tired because he was just sitting in this cave meditating, and sometimes he'd go to sleep. And he said, I got to figure out something out so I won't go to sleep. So the story goes, he cut off his eyelids so he couldn't close his eyes, and they fell to the ground. And when they hit the ground, they took root. And that's how tea started in China. Now, with a story like that, I mean, this guy is cool, you know. <laughs> and if you see pictures of Bodhidharma, his eyes are really big because he has no eyelids. So he started to talk about Zen. You know, and Zen is a really tough thing to talk about because Zen really has no words that can describe it. And if you're wondering about Zen... And the traditions of Zen, uh, what I have come to understand about that is we have Zen in Japan, we have Song in Korea, we have Chan in China, we have Tian in Vietnam. So we have these different schools of Zen. And I'm ordained in the Zen school of Vietnam. So my Vietnamese ordination name is Tik Tam Tian which would make me from the Tian school of Vietnam. And Tum has been translated in various ways, but the translation I like the best is heavenly heart mind, which really gives me something to work towards, because I am so far away from that. (laughs) And then there's Kusla, and Kusla was my first ordination name, my novice ordination name, and and that means skillful. And, and wholesome, which again, I'm not, but I'm working on it. And the great thing about Buddhism is you have a whole bunch of names to work with, and the reason you have all those names to work with is because it gives you a chance to be somebody else. You know, you're, you know, you're Kusla for a while, and then you're Tiktum Tien for a while, and each level of name requires you just to be a little bit better, a little more skillful, a little more insightful, 
And, and so as I go along and accumulate all these names, I keep changing and turning into somebody else. But there's enough causal connection between who I used to be and who I'm going to be that people still recognize me, and it's wonderful. Now, if you never get ordained, you still get different names, which is really cool. So the first name you might get is like husband and wife. Now, that identifies you as a very special person, and you have new duties to perform because you have that name. And that's why marriage is such a big deal, because it's a transformation process. Then, a year or so later, you become mom and dad. And talk about new duties, and talk about a higher level of awareness and being necessary to share with those little guys and gals who are going to be following your every move and repeating your every word. It requires a lot of personal discipline and insight. And then there's grandma and grandpa, which requires you just to show up occasionally, (laughs) (laughs) which is wonderful after all that hard work before. So names have a way of allowing us to grow at a much faster rate and not get caught. So here we have Bodhidharma, who now has no eyelids, but they're all drinking tea, And he starts to talk about Zen, and and now we have a whole different way of looking at Buddhism. Because in China, Buddhism got mixed up and stirred in with Taoism and Confucianism. And so those things were like really important to the Chinese, maybe not so much to the Indian tradition. But I think more importantly is they didn't they weren't begging any longer. They weren't mendicants wandering from village to village begging for their food. It seems to be that's not the stuff you did in China. So they built these wonderful monasteries. And, and they would practice in the monasteries. And occasionally people would come and visit them in the monasteries and get the Dharma teachings. Okay. But now it all changed again because now they had to go kill pigs and chickens to have dinner And the monks and nuns would say, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to kill them. That's going to ruin my karma forever. What are we going to do, they said to themselves. And I think they came up with, we're going to be vegetarian. We'll just go plant some crops and we'll kill corn and broccoli. Okay. So in the Mahayana tradition, most of them are vegetarian, but not all. In the Theravada tradition, most of them are meat eaters, but not all. And, and it's fine. And then in the Tibetan tradition, where you can't grow many crops when it was in Tibet, you know, they, they had a little mixture of both, you know, vegetarian and meat and, and high cholesterol with the yak milk and the tea and all that kind of stuff. So everybody is sort of like working it out where they were, how to be a Buddhist. So what did they say? We're not going to do what the Buddha said. That's not our tradition. We're going to do what the Buddha did. That's going to be our tradition. We're going to be bodhisattvas, not arahants. And now I'm reading all this stuff, and I'm going, wow, what an amazing chain of events that leads to a new way of looking at your practice and your tradition and eventually your salvation. Because the salvation will now be found in enlightenment rather than nirvana, according to me. That the idea of the bodhisattva is to become enlightened and to take a vow to be reborn as a human being as long as it takes to save all sentient beings from their suffering. As long as it takes. And we've never had less people. We've only had more people. Only had more people. I read a shocking, uh, a shocking statistic on Facebook. And they're up there. If you look carefully, you'll find shocking statistics on Facebook. <laughs> and this one said, L.A. County, Los Angeles County, has a greater population 
than 43 of the states. 43 of the states have a lesser population than we do in L.A. County. Are you wondering why you can't find parking? (laughs) Now you know. We have a whole lot of people living here, and it's a great place to live. We've got the best weather. We have a lot of things to do. Flash and trash can be found everywhere in L.A. County. But man. So I digress. So here we are, and we've got, I'm going to do what the Buddha did. I'm going to be a bodhisattva. And now you go back to the early Buddhist tradition of Theravada, and you find there was one bodhisattva. There wasn't a whole bunch. Nobody wanted to be bodhisattvas in Theravada. The one bodhisattva was the Buddha before he was the Buddha. And he took on all these different incarnations and even different animals and did good deeds, had good acts, and he eventually was born as Siddhartha Gautama. That ended his bodhisattva path, and then he became a Buddha. Now, in the Theravada tradition, there's still one more bodhisattva. And the bodhisattva is Maitreya. And that's the next Buddha. That's going to be the 29th Buddha. And he is now in Tusita heaven, waiting for the last person who knows Buddhism as we know it to die. And then he'll be reborn as a bodhisattva and achieve nirvana and become the next Buddha. But the Mahayana say, we're going to do what the Buddha did, so we're all going to be bodhisattvas, and we're all going to be Buddhas. Well, numerically, this causes a giant problem. Because you can only have one Buddha at a time in any planet or system. There's only one. You can't have two. It's not like Republicans and Democrats. You got one. And you have to wait for that one Buddha to die and his teachings to die in order to be reborn as a Buddha. So numerically, we have thousands, if not millions of people who are really into the Bodhisattva path, and they understand that one day they will become Buddhists. So what did they do in the Mahayana tradition? They said, hey, listen, even a dust moat, that little thing that floats through the air, you know, Even a dust moat is a world system, and you can be a Buddha on that dust moat. So now there's plenty of places to graduate to. Dust moats, world systems, meteorites, all sorts of places where you can be a Buddha. Okay. But the deal is they take this vow to be reborn as a human and continue the bodhisattva path until everyone is saved from their suffering, and that will take forever. It's going to be forever. It's a really long time to save all of us, you know? And, and, and so they're going to be disappointed, I think. But that's the system they have. So they're all working really hard to practice compassion and generosity and kindness All these really good characteristics and traits. They really want to change the world in a positive, special way. And so do the arhats. Once they've achieved their arhatship, they too turn back to the world and are of service to all the sentient beings who are suffering. Okay, so far so good. Now, if you're going to take a vacation between being reborn on Earth time and time again to help all sentient beings who are suffering, it's nice to have a place to go for a few hundred thousand lifetimes to relax. Just sort of kick back. Enjoy the fruits of your work and your service. So we have heaven. And heaven is really cool. Because it's just the way you want it to be. And you don't work. You don't have to save anybody. Everybody's just having a great time. And it's just the way you think life should have been before anyway. But the downside with heaven is this. It's not forever, according to Buddhism. It's a really long time, maybe 100,000 lifetimes. And then you have to leave. Because all the merit that puts you there, all that good karma that you acquired through all your acts of service and duty... They have worn out. And when you were in heaven, you were not able to do anything good for anybody because everything was good. 
So you are reborn, and your bodhisattva vows come into play again. You know? Okay, so, and then if you're lucky enough, you might have another heaven realm to go to. Now, I have to say that being sort of rooted in the Theravada tradition, heaven wasn't really high on my priority list. I'm thinking, I'm going to achieve nirvana, and, and heaven won't be necessary. It'll be fine. And of course, I was 40 at that time, and I had a strong practice, and I was overly optimistic. And as I turned 50, 60, and pushing 70, I'm thinking to myself, you know what? Maybe it's not in the cards this lifetime. Maybe I should hedge my bets and have a little heaven practice on the side. You know, just in case I don't make it to nirvana, at least I'll have a time to relax and enjoy all the fruits of my labor. So I ran across this place called Pure Land. And I thought, wow, that is so cool. There is this bodhisattva who became a Buddha and has his own heaven. And we can all go there because we're Buddhist. And the Christians have their heaven, and they go to their heaven. And the Muslims have their heaven, and they go to their heaven. But I don't think there's any cross heavens. I don't think you get to go to Christian heaven if you're a Buddhist. Because you just don't meet the qualifications. And I don't think the Christians get to go to Buddhist heaven. Because they don't sit long enough. So here we are, and we're going to go to Buddhist heaven. And so I said, well, how do I get there? What do I need to do? It is so simple, you only need to do three things. And you get to go to heaven. And you have to have faith that there is a heaven. You have to vow to Amitabha Buddha that you will work hard to get there. And you have to have devotion. And devotion is a tough thing for me. I I was never much into devotion. But I'm thinking, well, it is so easy. And then I came to understand that it was really designed for people in Asia who were illiterate long, long ago. But, of course, long, long ago, everybody was illiterate. And that's why we have our heaven, too. And all you have to do is believe and have faith. So I started to look at the simplicity of the three aspects of Pure Land. And then I started to look at the philosophy behind the three aspects of Pure Land. And it is so complicated and so deep and so profound that you wouldn't imagine a simple practice like that would lead to a profound philosophy that you find in the Pure Land tradition. So I've just posted three of the most important books in the Pure Land tradition, a link to them on my Facebook page. And if you're at all curious, you can download it for free. It's a PDF and read about Pure Land. But what an amazing evolution Mahayana has gone through. The great vehicle became even greater and more room for everybody. You didn't have to be a philosopher. You didn't have to read or write. You didn't have to be religious. You just needed to have a practice. And you didn't really need to have faith. You just needed to have confidence that it would work. So here we sit, and I'm going, okay, yeah. So that's a really big difference, Mahayana, compared to Theravada. And then we come to America. And like 100 years ago, Buddhism hit the shores. You know, and it was Theravada, it was Dharmapala, and he was a, a lay person, he was a lay Buddhist, and he, and, he, and he spoke in Chicago. And people heard for the first time Buddhism, you know, and they go, whoa, cool, what does it all mean? And then you had the people in England who were, who were translating all the ancient texts into English, but they were like Protestants, and they were translating like into Protestants. So there was sin, and there was thous, and these, and stuff like that. So our translations are much better now. So now we have Americans deciding to be American Buddhists. And and we're injecting into American Buddhism some of our cultural traits and making it so we can understand what the Buddha was saying 2,600 years ago going through the translation of 2017. And it is exciting because it's something that's really hard to share with family and friends, which is probably better off for them, but something that we can appreciate and practice every day and achieve our full perfection, too, as human beings in America, 
in L.A. County, which has more people than 43 states. Man. So what do you choose? Who do you want to be? You know, do you want to be the Arahant? Do you want to be the Bodhisattva? Do you want to be ordained? Do you want to be lay? Do you want to be married? Do you want to be single? Do you want to be an ascetic? Do you want to have everything you can possibly have? What do you want to be? And Buddhism seems to have something to say to everybody to make their life just a little bit better. So a lot of people come to Buddhism to have a better life. You know, to be happy. And gosh knows, the way things are going, to be happy is quite an effort these days. So Buddhism will help you be happy. And in being happy, what you're actually doing is suffering less. You know? So I don't want to be happy. I just want to suffer less. And it seems like happiness then. And it's fine. And, and so as I talk to people and I go around... Uh, sharing how I understand Buddhism to be, they say, well, what's the best kind of Buddhism? What's best for you? And I have come to the conclusion that everybody who practices Buddhism thinks their Buddhism is the best, and that's why they're practicing it. So when you go ask people about their Buddhism, what they're going to tell you is not what you should be, hopefully. What they're going to tell you is what they're doing. And then it's up to you to translate what they're doing into your life. Okay, well, this is how Eric Clapton plays the guitar. And I just bought an acoustic guitar, and I love the way Eric Clapton plays, so he's going to be my teacher. Well, you're not going to understand anything that he teaches you because you don't have those years and years of practice and skill and performance behind you. So when you're starting your Buddhist path, it's really good to find somebody who's sort of starting as well so you can talk to each other and, and share notes and understand what each one is saying, you know? And then you go, okay, well, I'm fine with that. Now I want to find a teacher. You know, and I get a lot of emails from people and messages on my Facebook page saying, can you recommend a teacher? I live in Oklahoma. I say, well, I don't know anybody in Oklahoma. Uh, North Dakota. I don't know anybody in North Dakota either. But you know, there's a lot of places you might be able to find a teacher. Sometimes at a yoga studio, you could find a yoga teacher. Unless it's called the Sun Yoga Studio, S-O-N, and then you might not be able to find one. And so, you'll be surprised that as a student, your teacher will appear when you're ready, not when the teacher's ready which drives all the teachers crazy. So, okay, so now you found your teacher. And you go, wow, this is so cool. I'm going to commit my life to this teacher, and I'm going to get exactly what he's got. Well, you will never get exactly what he's got, because he has a much different karma than you have. He has lived many lifetimes before in unique ways, just like you have. So you can't replicate your teacher's enlightenment. You have to work on your own enlightenment. And it will be different than his or hers. You have to be accepting of the fact that each of us is unique and we have our own stuff to work out. We have our own issues. We have our own roadblocks that we need to push aside. But the teacher will help you if you listen carefully to what he did and how he understands Buddhism. And that will give you a chance to look at yourself in a rather unique way. How do I understand Buddhism? What do I want to do? You know? And you may not want to do what he did. You know, he may be sitting in a monastery eight hours a day meditating. You may want something more than that from your life. Not that there's anything wrong with that, and he'll probably get enlightened faster than you will. But he's not going to the movies. He doesn't have a job. He's not dating. He's sitting there working on himself. So here you go, American Buddhism. It seems the portal, the doorway to American Buddhism is meditation. Is meditation. A lot of people just go to the temple and offer incense. Okay, well that's fine. That works at some level. That's devotion. But the Americans seem to want, and maybe Europeans too, they want meditation. They want to do something. 
So we're going to meditate, you know, and we're going to sit and do nothing for eight hours because we're doing something. And that's cool. So do the meditation techniques transfer from Mahayana to Theravada? Well, according to some meditation manuals, there are 44 different ways to meditate. And the four kinds of insight meditation, which would be Theravada, early Buddhism, and 40 kinds of samatha meditation, tranquility, which would be more Mahayana than Theravada. But again, every time you make an absolute statement, everybody raises their hand and says, you're wrong. So some Mahayana do insight, vipassana, and some Theravada do samatha, tranquility. It's just the way life works. But they take you to two different places, according to me. I have to keep putting that in there as a disclaimer, because if you say that it's true, it's only true because Kusla has an opinion about it. And that may not qualify as truth. So, inside meditation, what's the deal? The deal is, inside meditation is the most direct route the most direct path to nirvana. Absolutely. And and most traditions will tell you that. Even the Mahayana will tell you that. But see, the Mahayana, again, has a different goal, don't they? They don't want to be a Buddha. They don't want to achieve nirvana. They want to be a bodhisattva. They want enlightenment. So the insight meditation wouldn't necessarily give them enlightenment. And I'll talk about enlightenment and nirvana in a few minutes. So now we go to the tranquility meditation, and tranquility meditation can lead you to enlightenment, but not nirvana. And I think when the Buddha was in India practicing tranquility meditation, taught to him by the yogis of India, by the ascetics of India, he probably achieved enlightenment many times. But he never achieved nirvana. So it's said that the Buddha rediscovered insight meditation that had been lost to the world with the last Buddha and the last person knowing Buddhism, rediscovered it, used it to achieve his Buddhahood, and he became the Buddha. Cool. But he couldn't do it practicing the traditions of India at that time because it didn't lead to nirvana. So we're lucky he was there. We're lucky he shared with us through the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, how he did it and what he did. And then it's up to us to figure out how we can do it, how it will fit into our practice, into our world, which is dramatically different from his world. So let me just give you a quick, what is nirvana, what is enlightenment, according to me? Nirvana, the end of suffering, the end of karma, the end of all future rebirths. Nirvana. Enlightenment, the direct experience of the interconnectedness and interdependence of all phenomena. Say it one more time. The direct experience of the interconnectedness and interdependence of all phenomena, which does not make you anything other than realize the ultimate truth, according to Mahayana Buddhism, that everything is everything connected. There's, none of us are separate. It's an illusion, it's a fabrication, it's something self-ego personality was able to do to allow us to live in this very complicated world. So we're lucky that we are separate in a delusional way because we can leave the door open and closed and we can drive our car and we can go to the grocery store because we're separate from the grocery store and the door and the car. We're interacting with it. But if you were one with your car, you could never drive it. (laughs) It would just be you in the car. (laughs) So how did that change? I mean, how how does an enlightened person look at the world now? Well, for me, I'm thinking it might work like this. That if someone is homeless, you're homeless because you're connected to them. If someone is hungry, you're hungry. On the other end of the spectrum, if someone is having a good day, you're having a good day. If somebody feels fulfilled and successful, you have that part of you that feels fulfilled and successful. You are every man and every man is you. You are every woman and every woman is you. Wow. 
So where does that leave you? Well, it leaves you with a heck of a lot of work to do because all those men and women that you've become are suffering more than they are happy. And if you want to end more of your suffering, you have to help them end their suffering. And it's never-ending because we have more and more people all the time who come into this world who are suffering. And here we are, the Bodhisattva. Wow, no wonder i got to come back so many times. Because they're me and I'm them and everybody's suffering and I'm suffering. And if I want to end my suffering, i got to figure out how to end their suffering. Okay, so you're doing that and you go, okay, that's cool. In the big picture of nirvana, I think what the insight meditation does is it allows us to three, the, see the three aspects of Buddhist wisdom clearly and apply them to our life. So the three aspects of Buddhist wisdom that become clear with insight meditation and not necessarily so with tranquility meditation are anicca, dukkha, anatta, Pali, which means impermanence, suffering, not self. So the first one, the impermanence of everything, mind especially, when you're sitting in meditation for a half hour, how many different thoughts did you have? You know, how many different clusters were created by just one thought? And then the gong rings and bang, you sort of come back to the moment for a while, but now you're interpreting what's being said or done through your thoughts, through your ideas, through your education, through your experience, and that doesn't quite get you there either, but you have an intellectual understanding, you just don't have an intuitive knowing. Okay. But the intuition is, you know, often not looked at as being important in the beginning. So you have, everything's impermanent. My mind's impermanent. My body's impermanent. The world's impermanent. It's always changing. It's always in flux. There's no place to stand. I can't hold on to anything. I can't push away anything. Everything's always moving. Man. And I don't want to get old, but I have to get old. I don't want to die, but I got to die. I don't want to work, but I got rent to pay. Everything's changing all the time. Okay. So that's a really big insight. And that allows you to not hold as tightly to the world around you. To not hold as tightly to the concepts about the world that you've carried with you for all these years. The grasp, the grip is starting to soften and loosen and the hands are starting to open. Now we come to the second one. Life is ultimately unsatisfactory all the time, no matter what you do. Not always unsatisfactory, but ultimately it always turns into being imperfection, not perfection. It always turns out to be, it could be better, if only. And that if only never materializes. It always turns out to be, if only I did this when I should have done that, and da 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 And, you know, and so we just run through all these scenarios and ideas and trying to put them into place in the real world, but the real world is changing faster than even our thoughts about the real world, so it doesn't work out. So we come to the conclusion that ultimately, no matter what I do, because of impermanence, my life is going to be unsatisfactory. At different levels, there's really unsatisfactory, there's just a little unsatisfactory. Like the mashed potatoes are cold. That's a little unsatisfactory. It's not a big deal. Then you go to the 405, and there's been an accident, and you're stuck in traffic for two hours. Now, that's a bigger deal. And you just go, yeah, the Buddha was right. And he didn't even drive. (laughs) So lastly, we have anatta. I am not who I think I am. Wow. Wow. So with all the names I've been given in my ordination process, yeah, I I knew who I used to be. I sort of feel like I know what I am now, but I'm not sure what's going to happen. And I might even get more names. Like at our center, we have, you're a reverend for the first 10 years, okay? Then after 10 years of ordination, you become a venerable. And then after 25 years of ordination, you become a master, so I'm thinking, whoa, how does a master act, you know? How cool is that? He knows everything. He always says the right thing. He doesn't cause any suffering anywhere. I'll never leave my room again. <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
So there I am. And so now I'm looking at this idea of self, not self. And, and thankfully, I'm at the Bodhi Tree bookstore. And thankfully, I'm in the used book section. And thankfully, there is Ken Wilber, Spectrum of Consciousness. Dog-eared, highlighted, half-price, eye bottom Because somehow I knew by touching that book, I would find the answer to my own identity. And I did. It was there. It was in that book. And, and he doesn't even like that book anymore. He thinks his other books are so much more profound than that one. And I'm thinking, that was the best book he ever wrote because what it did is it confirmed what I suspected. And in some cases, it confirmed what I already knew. And I just posted something on Facebook about that. The best book you're ever going to read is the one that shows you what you already know. I'm thinking, yes, that's cool. We need those confirmations occasionally just to know we're not insane and we're on the right path. So he was this guy that said, you know what? We have all these different levels and we have all. We have the the infant level and we have the middle age level and the senior level. And then we have this transcendent level that goes beyond all of them. But you never lose the rest of them. They're just put into sort of a different way of looking at things, and I'm going, oh, man, this is it. This is not self. This is cool. I can use this in the world not to be me. Well, you can't, because you're always going to be you, even if you don't want to be you. And even if you think you're not being you, you're still being you. And and I think that's what I love about Ram Dass, is no matter how insightful and enlightened he became, he was always Ram Dass and had the best stories. You know, and he failed miserably in some things and succeeded wonderfully in other things. But he was always wrong to us. And sometimes he would say that there would be times in his life where he had clarity and wisdom. And then his old friend Neurosis would show up. (laughs) And he would say, how are you? I haven't seen you for a long time. So... No matter what we do, I think ultimately, maybe even in nirvana or enlightenment, we're still going to do the same stuff, but just differently. And most people probably won't notice the difference. You know? So you're just going to be doing stuff, and you'll be causing less suffering, but you won't be knowing why you're causing less suffering, because you're doing the same stuff you did before, but the intention will be different. And that will translate into speech and action. So after talking about enlightenment and nirvana and Mahayana and Theravada, do any of those schools have something in common? What do they have in common? Four things for sure. Four things for sure. Number one, they have the Buddha in common. Number two, they have the Dharma in common. Number three, they have the Sangha in common. And number four, they have an important triad in common. And that is... Precepts, I will practice personal discipline. I will practice meditation, mental purification, and I will acquire wisdom and insight. So personal discipline, meditation, wisdom and insight. They have those things in common. Every school of Buddhism, every culture, it translates perfectly into every culture. So... Who are you and what are you going to practice? It's going to be up to you. You know, I I, I share a story quickly about my mom who was dying. She was 84. She had a full life. She'd always work. She'd raise four children as a single parent. And during that time of raising us as kids, she had two jobs and went back to school. ASU. And I'm going, whoa. So she was just like doing something all the time. And, of course, none of us appreciated her, you know. Because she was a disciplinarian. She always told us what to do and how to do it. And, and that's what mothers are supposed to do, ultimately. So now she's dying. She's 84. I go to visit her a month before her demise. And she looks at me, and seriously, she says, do you have any suggestions? You know? Now, I knew my mom. And my answer was, do it your way. Because she was going to do it that way anyway. (laughs) No matter what I said. But I thought it was nice of her to ask, you know. 
And she had a wonderful death. She walked right into it, you know. She, she didn't want to know what was killing her. She never found out the diagnosis. And she continued to smoke until that last day. And she continued to have a little scotch and water every night. And that's what she did. And then she liked to watch, you know, um, TV. And so she would watch TV. And she slowly got thinner and smaller and weaker. And, and then one day she just decided to die. But she was in the hospital. And she said, I can't die here. I, I can't die here. And so the doctors released her. And she, an ambulance came and took her back to her house. And my nieces and nephews were there. And my nieces are, are, are um, um, in the business of health care. They're both nurses. And so they made her comfortable. And with six hours in her bed, she was dead. She knew she was home. And so she did it her way, you know. Even the doctors couldn't prevent that. So our life is up to us. You may not think so at most of the time, but it really is up to us. And what we choose defines who we'll be in the future. And what we want to do is to be clever enough to see what's happening in the present moment so we can create a future moment. We can only change the future by doing it today. And hopefully we'll find our path And hopefully, if we don't achieve enlightenment or nirvana, at least we'll suffer a little less.